Ladies and gentlemen, John Sylvester is an award-winning crime writer and columnist, and of course he is the co-author of the best-selling books that form the basis of the hugely successful Australian TV series Underbelly and of course Chopper Reed. I should say that John's books hold the record as Australia's most shoplift books. <laughs> he also appears weekly on 3AW Breakfast with his moniker, The Sly of the Underworld. John studied at La Trobe University and completed a Bachelor of Arts in Politics and Law in 1978. Post-university, he dedicated his life to crime, <laughs> reporting, <laughs> working with the Herald Sun and since 1993 with The Age. To get a sense of his dedication to crime, it might be useful to know that his father, Fred, was a former Victoria Police Assistant Commissioner and head of the Australian Bureau of Criminal Intelligence. He won an ACN AJA scholarship to study crime and corruption in Southeast Asia, has given evidence at Royal Commissions on Police Corruption, published more than 20 crime books, and has won the coveted Walkley Award, three Quills, a Ned Kelly Award for True Crime Writing, and three Victoria Law Awards. We won't hold it against him, but he is a passionate fan, of course, and supporter and member of the Hawthorne Football Club. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, to deliver the 12th annual Bob Rose Lecture, would you please welcome John Sylvester. Well, what a privilege. Um, I must say that when the age lawyer, David Poulton, rang me uh, about this function, my throat closed with fear. Uh, for two good reasons, because when David rings me, it normally means some toothless psychopath is about to sue us. <laughs> and secondly, uh, David normally charges between three to seven grand for one phone call. <laughs> I long have learnt that a telephone to a Collins Street lawyer is the equivalent to a knife for a Gurkha. <laughs> when they're picked up, they must draw blood. <laughs> but he said, he wanted me to speak here, and I realised instantly, of course, I wasn't the first choice. <laughs> that would have been Caroline Wilson, but she's been so busy working undercover. <laughs> for the last seven months, she's been disguised as a tree <laughs> in James Hurd's front garden. <laughs> the next most logical choice would have been Mark Robinson, but he's been undercover disguised as a koala sitting in a tree in James Hurd's front garden. <laughs> but then I realised if I'm going to talk about football, that's why David is on the big bucks, because it gives me a chance to right a great wrong. And it involves the Rose family. Because we know the history of the game. We know that Tom Wills invented the game back in the 1850s. And we know that the Indigenous game was invented by Junior Junior Junior, Junior, Junior Rioli in a bid to strengthen his hamstrings. <laughs> Didn't work. That is the traditional game, the game of Gladstone Bags, of Brill Cream, of set position play, of Abbott's Lager. But the question is, who invented the modern game? Many people say, of course, it was Ron Barassi in 1970 against Bob Rose's Collingwood at half time. He, he got them to play on. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a lie, because I've done the research and I can tell you that the modern game was in fact invented two years, two months earlier, in August 1968, at the Whittlesea Showgrounds. How do I know that? Because I was there. <laughs> because, ladies and gentlemen, I am the inventor <laughs> of the modern game. John Gordon was Prime Minister. Uh, Lionel Rose had just won the World Championship against Fighting Arado. And there was to be a jamboree of football. Twelve scouting groups were to meet at 1968 at Whittlesea. Two competitions, each um, a lightning premiership, 20 minutes per half, with the winners playing the next week. I was a cub who'd just come up to the first Preston Scouts. And the Scoutmaster came over to me and he said, We've got to go in this competition. Now, I can play with a toggle, I can play British Bulldog, and I can do a reefer knot, but I know nothing about this game. <laughs> can you help me? I said, OK, la, I will. 
and I appointed myself unilaterally playing coach and vice captain. <laughs> to appoint yourself captain coach at the age of 11 would be the act of a megalomaniac. <laughs> so I appointed my best friend, Ricky Jarman, now Dr. Ricky Jarman, one of the best paediatricians in the country, as captain and assistant coach. <laughs> we were, ladies and gentlemen, the first known leadership team. <laughs> now we were, this was an open competition, so some of these kids were 16. Most of us hadn't reached puberty. And those who had, had to go Brazilian as an act of solidarity with the club. <laughs> we were tiny. So we had a training session and I turned to Ricky and I said, do you know what we've got here, Ricky? He said, what? I said, we've got a mosquito fleet. <laughs> we had about three tall players. So if we played the mark and kick game, it was inevitable we were going to lose. So I developed a system where you had to play on at all costs, that the only time you could kick over the mark was kicking out or having a shot for goal. We developed drills where our tall players, just a few of them, had to lead. The ball was kicked to them and then they had to handball to our smaller players who ran past. They had to develop skills on both sides of the body. <laughs> I got the playing group together and discussed it, and to my relief, they bought into the game plan. <laughs> so we trained and we trained and we trained in secret. And the week before, we invited the parents to an open session, and there was silence as we did their drills. And the scoutmaster came out and said to me, this is not a game that anyone is familiar with. And there were some doubts. I said, I need the full support of the board. <laughs> it was simply too late for them to change. <laughs> we arrived at the Woodlesey Showground by bus. Most of the other people arrived, the other players arrived in cars. They were driving them. It was the northern suburbs, most of them were stolen. <laughs> there was the bounce of the ball. Somehow, it came to me. I kicked a bit of a shank kick over my left shoulder. It was marked by the centre half forward, who handballed immediately to Ricky Jarman running through, who took a bounce, who kicked it to the full forward who was leading. Jarman kept running. He took the handball again into the open goal. A goal. The goal umpire didn't move, there was silence. Three times the umpire declared all clear until he finally waved the flags. It was like we'd sent a jet fighter in amongst tiger moths. <laughs> again and again we did this. Three games on the Saturday, two on the Sunday. We won all of them. There was silence. We went to a picnic at a creek near Whittlesea with our scout group. I was at the creek and I was skimming rocks, you know how they bounce? And I noticed that if you threw them a certain way, they'd bounce the other way. And I said to the kid next to me, do you see that? And he said, yes, I do. And I said, what's your name? He said, my name's Peter Dacos. <laughs> Standing there, I was struck by a rock the size of a grapefruit, <laughs> thrown by a local bully. Split my head open, I fell in the creek. I always wanted to get him back, but sadly in 1983 he was pushed under a train in Paddington Station in London. There was no CCTV footage, sadly. No, there was an open fine and giving on that. <laughs> I went to some psychopath doctor who stitched me up. So then I was concussed, but I was playing coach. So I gave myself a fitness test on the Thursday in front of the breakout heater while league teams was on and I passed. <laughs> so we came to the final game and it poured rain. We couldn't get our Jenkin high cut football boots out of the mud. We were playing giants, I think they were from Macedonia, I don't know what, they, Mastodons perhaps, I don't know what they were. They were huge. The play on game couldn't work. It was absolute slop. I put our biggest and, and sort of slightly overweight uh, fellow at full forward and I said just dive on the footy and yelled out to everyone kick it to the fat slide <laughs> it didn't work at three quarter time because this was a full time game I tried to rouse the troops I got them together and I said just remember boys 
the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And at that point, Dr Ricky Jarman turned and said, no, the bigger they are, the harder we fall. <laughs> That's when I knew I'd lost the player group. <laughs> so we lost, and that game was shelved. So how did Ron Barassi steal that game plan? We were first Preston Scouts, and we were affiliated with Preston Scouts in the PDGFA, the Preston District Junior Football Association. We wore their jumpers, which was dark blue with a light blue yoke. They were delivered on the day by the president of the Preston Scouts. Check your records, ladies and gentlemen, and you will find that Ron Barassi's junior football side was Preston Scouts. So quite clearly the president stole the idea <laughs> and gave it to him. So I apologise to the Rose family because if it wasn't for that, uh, the 1970 premiership would, would have been Collingwood's. Barassi, of course, gets a statue at the MCG. I get zippity squat. <laughs> My next uh, big uh, revelation in football was corridor football. I invented that two years later as a scared wingman playing for Preston Scouts. Wearing number eight, we played the Heidelberg Colts. Um, we ran out to play under 14s. Crowd was three deep, all drinking long necks, <laughs> which was surprising because it was nine in the morning. I was progressing this idea of continuous football, so the ball was on the ground and I went to kick it off the ground when some bloke dived on it. So I kicked him fair in the guts. <laughs> the crowd went silent, he lay there, but I thought the tactic should have worked, so I attempted it again and kicked him in the guts again. So the crowd began screaming, kill number eight. That's when I invented corridor football, because <laughs> I wouldn't go anywhere near the wing <laughs> and rang up and down the middle. Completion of that game, I ran home along Darabin Creek in a scene and not seen since the movie Cool Hand Luke. And we had to come back the next day to get my clothes. So I retired <laughs> from the game of football to spectate. And as you've been told, I follow Hawthorne. Why do I follow Hawthorne? My father came from England in 1948 as a bobby to join the Victoria Police. And of course, the first thing any local would say is, Who do you follow in the football, Fred? And he'd say, No one. So he'd have to listen for two hours about why it was the greatest game in the world. So in the end he looked around and saw that Hawthorne hadn't won a game for two years. So he picked Hawthorne, because it was the ultimate conversation stopper. <laughs> Who do you follow in the football? Hawthorne. Oh, it was like saying, how's your wife? She's dead. <laughs> so we began to follow the game closely, and of course this was when Hawthorne was coming good. And in 1971, I became a member with my father. And of course, at Glenfrey Oval, there were the signs, Hale Hudson Hawthorne's heartbeat, and Kennedy's commandos, the most courageous and classy footballers fighting their way towards the final four. And we went to every game, and it was suburban football. And I remember we had an 11-game winning streak, and we went to Victoria Park. Now, I was probably, I don't know, 15, um, absolute heartthrob. Um, could have been in a boy band. <laughs> Think a younger version of David Cassidy out of the Partridge family and that's what you got. And I was learning that you could banter with opposition supporters. And it was at Victoria Park and I remember how that sort of smoke haze used to sit over the ground. And uh, it was in the third quarter and Wayne Richardson was running towards the railway end in that signature move where he did the balk and he had the hand out like this. It was fantastic. Lee Matthews ran the other way with his signature move, which was this one. <laughs> now, I'd been bantering with a fellow going, you know, come on, Peter Hudson, and he'd go, he's a homosexual. Uh, <laughs> come on, Bob Ketty, and he questioned his sexuality. So it was real good banter. So when Wayne Richardson landed on the ground, I said, oops, he better go to hospital. And uh, he didn't find that amusing. So this fellow came through the crowd he had rings on his fingers and tattoos. So I did the most sensible thing. I hid behind my father. <laughs> and as this bloke arrived, my old man pulled out his Freddy, his police badge, and said, mate, go back to where you, you, you were standing or we'll take this up at the police station. So he grumbled through his three teeth and headed back to where he was. <laughs> and I learned an important lesson there, that a good big man will always be a good little man. Three or four weeks later, we went to the MCG, much more sedate ground, but it was the Richmond crowd. 
and sadly we sat behind three old ladies who could have been the witches out of Macbeth. <laughs> they had one good teeth between the three of them <laughs> and the, uh, the false teeth seemed to be made out of uh, piano keys, basically. They were drinking cream sherry and they were knitting. And they were bagging Hawthorne at every opportunity. And then one of them started raving on about a player called Ray Boinvich. And I leaned over and said, Madam, his name's Ray Boinvich and he's a Hawthorne reject. She turned around with a knitting needle and stabbed me between the fourth <laughs> and the fifth rib. So I looked at my father for some backup and he said, you're a smart ass, you deserved it. <laughs> I learned another lesson. You can't beat experience. Three years later, 1973 no, or 74, we were going to the footy in the E.H. Holden. My father said, who's the best coach in the competition? I said, John Kennedy, Dad, no question. He said, so if we go in the rooms, you won't tell him how to coach the side, will you? <laughs> I said, I would never dream of it. So it was the first time we actually went into the rooms. And I looked at the blackboard and Mick Moncrief was in the back pocket. I thought, that's absolutely crazy. <laughs> now I promised I wouldn't say anything but you can't let a train wreck happen, can you? <laughs> so I was introduced to John Kennedy. And I said, Mr. Kennedy, someone's been playing with your blackboard. <laughs> you got Mick Moncrief in the back pocket. He surely could, should be full forward. He looked through me and walked away. My father was mortified. Mick Moncrief kicked 625 games at full forward, which shows even great men can make mistakes. <laughs> so we go through this beautiful journey and we end, of course, in 1996 with the possibility of losing Hawthorne to merge and we got ourselves involved in the uh, anti-merge people, Operation Payback. Uh, the name Payback was my choice so I suppose in a way some people could say I saved Hawthorne <laughs> and they stopped the merge uh, possibility so I probably saved Footscray and Melbourne and St Kilda. Some people would say that, I wouldn't because I'm modest. But it was then that you saw the real passion of the supporters. It was six and a half thousand members at that time. And the whole purpose of Payback was to open the doors. Hawthorne called itself the family club, but in fact it was a clique. It was a clique of the social club and the inner sanctum. So there was this latent supporter base out there who wanted to be involved. Payback gave them the opportunity. The reason it was called Payback was because it was for the supporters to pay back the club for all the pleasure it had given them. Because football is not a game for the officials or the players. It's part of the DNA. When my father came here, there was football and there was cricket and there was racing. Cricket has imploded upon itself chasing money. Racing now is purely a place for B-grade celebrities to go to sniff cocaine off their own bottoms. <laughs> and football remains part of the DNA. Hawthorne is going to play Geelong in a couple, of, a couple of days and normally that's a Friday night game and I'd leave the age and I'd walk to the MCG and I would see people with their Hawthorne scarves and their Geelong scarves and they'd be sitting together and they'd be talking and then I'd hop on the train after the game and there'd be supporters of both sides talking in a most pleasant way because we have the passion of say the South American soccers, soccer fans without the violence. It is an integral part of our culture. One of my heroes is a fellow called Professor Andrew Kay. He's a neurosurgeon and while we're sitting here today he's probably saving a life or telling somebody he can't save theirs. And if you go into his rooms there's no happy family shots, there's no pictures of his holidays, there's a picture of the Hawthorne footy side, because he's a member of the board. But he has it there for a reason. He doesn't want the happy family shots when he might be telling you such bad news. But he knows that's the greatest social lubricant there is in Melbourne. But anyone sitting down, terrified about the news they can about to hear, can go, oh, so you're a hawks man. I'm a magpie myself. It breaks all barriers. So what we have now is a competition, and we go back to the thought of payback, where we gave it back at Hawthorne to the supporters. 
and I've heard it said that next year is going to be the year of the fan. I do not give a stuff about the fan. I'm a fan of Mexican food, but I'm not going to cry if my favourite Mexican restaurant goes out of business. Fans are theatre goers, and if we are seduced by trying to get them there, we do it at the expense of the core. It should be the year of the supporter. And the supporter is because they support their club. They support it through thick and thin. Think of the Melbourne supporters who are bleeding now, the Footscray supporters who haven't seen a premiership in their lifetime, but every year they back up and they buy their memberships. Think of the Collingwood supporters who buy their base membership. With absolute certainty, they will never meet a player, they will never go to the president's room, they will never go to a super box, and they will never be guaranteed a grand final ticket. They're the supporters, and the AFL must open the game back to the supporter. And within the boardroom, there should be a sign. <laughs> what does the supporter think? Stuff the fan. It is about not damaging the core. We talk of growing the game. Remember, every empire in history has collapsed. The importance here, it's not an industry. We talk of stakeholders. A stakeholder, to me, is a knife and fork you use at Blado's. <laughs> it begins and ends with the supporter. So the challenge for Collingwood and Hawthorne and every other club is to give value added back to the loyal supporter. That is the core, that is why it's part of the DNA, that is why it's Melbourne. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, John Sylvester. So you're to blame for the fact that football is stuffed, John. You invented this game. Thank you, John. That was uh, outstanding, very entertaining, and uh, I'm sure we all enjoyed it. Thanks again, please, John Sylvester. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, now to respond, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome a man who began covering football 31 years ago for the Sun News Pictorial, if you don't mind. In 1987, he moved to The Age, 27 years ago, and still finds himself there writing about football. He's also worked with great distinction on radio with 3AW and currently with SEN. In 2008, he won the AFL Media Award for the Most Outstanding Feature Writer. Would you please give him a big welcome from The Age, Rowan Connolly. How am I supposed to follow that? Thank you very much, Sly. And thanks, David, for handing me the uh, poison chalice. I feel like I've just been treated to a routine from the late lamented uh, Robin Williams. Um, so I apologise in advance for being the Kevin Bloody Wilson. Uh, to the essence of what Sly had to talk about, um, I couldn't agree more. I agree 200%. There's no doubt the balance has been tipped away from the hardcore died in the wall football supporter and I think the AFL is aware of that but as I, I like to think of myself as one of those grassroots supporters um, it's why I, be, I became interested in the game it's why I became interested in being a football journalist and it's something that to be perfectly frank I've had trouble reconciling with uh, being a professional media person my entire career and most of my colleagues can give you plenty of juicy examples uh, of the trouble I've occasionally found myself in. Um, I was reminded about my supporting roots the, the other week when uh, an old school friend I hadn't seen for about 35 years rang into Neil Mitchell's 3AW program to uh, recount an incident which fortunately I'd managed to wipe from the recesses of my mind and it was um, involving, you know, you hear about the stereotypical old granny with the, the umbrella 
And I think a lot of people think that's a bit of a myth, but I can tell you they exist and I, well, we, we confronted one one day when we were both 13. I was in the terraces at Windy Hill. Uh, we were following Essendon, she was a Collingwood supporter. And uh, being the very tough little 13 year old I was, I spent the whole day baiting her until she couldn't take any more and about halfway through the last quarter unleashed with the very big thick wooden handle end of the umbrella. Fortunately for me I was reasonably light on my feet in those days and I ducked the said umbrella thus connecting with my friend's head and sending him into oblivion. He um, actually was quite dazed and confused for the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> well, I'll, t I'll come to the Essendon supporters. Um, a couple of weeks later, he uh, managed to be persuaded to accompany me to the football again. It was a, a less incident-packed afternoon, but I had to acquaint him with the various rituals that go with being a, a dyed in the wool fan, and we've all had them. You know, the journeys to the old suburban grounds, the trains and the trams and the meeting points you have, which, to be honest, are, are probably half the enjoyment you get from a day at the football. Um, you know, me and my mates used to have a meeting spot on Platform 9 at uh, Flinders Street, and there was a hot chocolate machine, and we all had to have a hot chocolate and if we didn't, our team would definitely lose. So, you know, the, the days you'd turn up and the vending machine was out of order, we felt like going home before even bothering to get to the ground. Anyway, this day, we survived the afternoon at Windy Hill. We came home. We got off a train at Caulfield Station. He was all set to go, and I said, no, no, we haven't finished yet. I've got to go to the local Chinese takeaway and get my obligatory three steamed dim sims, which I did, and then head next door to play the pinball machines. I think Bobby Orr's power play was the the game of choice in about 1978. Unfortunately for him, I proceeded to rack up free game after free game after free game, and Ritual demanded that he wasn't allowed to leave till I'd played them all. So he ended up two hours late home that night and was never allowed to go to the football with me again, which I think he was always dirty about, hence him dobbing me in on 3AW the other week. I was comforted, though, to learn that the thing about pinball machines and football wasn't exclusive to supporters. One of my favourite footy stories is about the uh, first season of Tim Watson and Paul Vanderhaar at Essendon in 1977. Vander was 18 and had just got his licence. Tim Watson was still, believe it or not, 15 when he made his debut. So it was left to Vander to pick Tim Watson up on the way to the Western Oval where Essendon were playing Footscray. Well, Vander, even though he was 18, he'd had a his usual Friday night, you know, half a dozen cans, I'm sure Ben can relate to this, half a dozen cans and a couple of cartons of smokes and all those things that the Flying Dutchman used to do. Picked up Tim Watson on his way through and he said, mate, I've got to eat, I, I haven't eaten. So they stopped off at a hamburger joint not far from the ground and while he's waiting for his hamburger, he gets on the pinball machine, of course, racks up the free games, refused to let Tim leave until he played all the free games they were about half an hour late for the team meeting, whereupon they were disciplined. Both started on the reserves bench in those days, not the interchange. Tim Watson came on and played one of the worst games of his career, barely got a kick. Paul Vanderhaar, as you'd expect, came on and was close to best on ground. But uh, different strokes for different folks in those days, I suppose. Look, I, I was definitely a very, very f uh, feral football fan that you hear a lot about. I'd been going, watching Essendon play week in, week out since the age of six. In my teens, I managed to twice get chased by police halfway around a VFL football ground. The first time was at Arden Street in 1979 when, uh, an, in a packed house, I, I got a really good vantage point on the roof of the terracing behind the Arden Street goals. Cops came around and said, you're gonna have to get down. And I, I tossed up between doing the right thing and leaving my spot and I said, look, sorry, I can't, it's just too good. So they chased me around half the ground. Um, the second occasion was a few years later when I should have known better. It was the day Paul Salmon did his knee at Victoria Park in 1984. And myself and a, a posse of Essendon fans stupidly rolled up too late and were confronted with the house full size. Well, that was gonna prove no deterrent to us. So in one beautifully orchestrated man manoeuvre, we hit the fence as one in front of everyone, the cops, everything, scaled the fence, and proceeded to get chased around to the Yarra Falls end where we disappeared into the, uh, the seeding masses. It was sort of like one of those prison break movies, except on Rewind, we were breaking in rather than breaking out. 
I've done lots of things I shouldn't have. I've pelted coins at cheer squad members carrying around the collection blanket and been chased by them and got my just desserts. I've chased opposition trainers down the race after their side had had the temerity to beat Essendon and one of them had flipped the bird at the Windy Hill faithful. He was about 80, but I was still going to club him into submission. I've even had one day in 1984, Brian Taylor, then full forward for Richmond, try to climb over the fence to get at me after I'd repeatedly bagged him as he was dragged after being goalless against Billy Duckworth and being paraded around the boundary line. I reminded BT of that. Isn't it great too to know that 30 odd years later, it's still possible to spend a Saturday abusing BT and this time seemingly have the rest of the football world with you because they'd like a little bit more incisive commentary than boy, oh boy, we. <laughs> One of the problems though with the sins of your footballing youth is that they can come back to haunt you as a supposedly adult professional. I've hated the likes of Tony Shaw, Dermot Brereton and Lee Matthews with a passion as a young football fan, only to have my childish prejudices shaken to the core by subsequently working with them and finding out they're in fact pretty decent blokes. But I suppose if you spend your youth living vicariously through the deeds of AFL footballers, it's not too big a leap to do so when it comes to your career. Being a football journalist doesn't exactly carry the dangers of being a war correspondent or like Sly, dealing with some very shady underworld characters. But there are moments of great fear and anxiety. And we, mo most of us in the media still confront them every week when Mick Malthouse does a press conference <laughs> after Carlton has lost yet again. Just ask Mark Stevens. I've come close to copying one from Lee Matthews in the press box the day of the 1993 preliminary final. When I was sitting next to him, he was writing for the Sunday Age. Essendon was 44 points behind Adelaide at half-time, but mounted a, a furious comeback out of nowhere in the third quarter. The tension was overwhelming. I got a little too excited, leapt up out of my seat and managed to knock his steaming hot cup of coffee all over him. And I thought, uh, he's going to do to me what he did to Neville Bruns about eight years previously. <laughs> I broke a bone in my hand one day at Waverley back in the early 90s when I smashed it on the desk in frustration, but still courageously managed to soldier on and finish my match report. And back in the days of the free-for-all press conferences at those old pokey suburban grounds, uh, I once prepared to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Channel 7 cameraman as we all jostled for space in front of the victorious coach who happened to be Footscray's Alan Joyce. He was highly amused by it. In fact, he announced to the assembled throng that um, our dust-up might be far more entertaining than anything he had to say which to anyone who ever heard an Alan Joyce press conference, I can confirm is completely correct. <laughs> to be honest, I, I used to be a bit of a fruit loop on game days, even in a professional capacity, probably most driven home to me on the morning of the 1993 grand final when I decided to arrive at the MCG at about 11 a.m., about three hours in advance. I hadn't been able to eat for three days, I was so nervous. And I happened to pull up early enough to have a car pull up next to me and out jumps Mark Thompson, Essendon captain, about to launch into the most important day of his entire football career. He looked fresh as anything. I was a wreck. So I thought, I don't want to disturb his focus. So I got out of my car and walked away, and I'd get about 20 metres away, and somebody else said, oi! And I turned around, it's Bomber, he's gesturing for me, and I thought, oh, what, this is going to be words of wisdom. And he goes, shit, mate, are you all right? You look bloody terrible. <laughs> This guy's about to go out and play for the Premiership. Well, I should have taken the cue from his confidence, but several hours later, as the media was being taken across the MCG to go to the rooms, Essendon's in the middle of their lap of honour, and I was just overwhelmed. I cut loose from the pack to run towards the Essendon players and literally jump into the arms of Tim Watson. A moment, unfortunately, which uh, was captured by the Channel 7 coverage and for which I've been pill pilloried ever since, among other things. I've always argued, though, that um, passion for the game has to be a prerequisite for doing this job. And in a lot of ways, I like to think that most of us covering footy are glorified fans. Now, that may occasionally come with accompanying biases, but we do what we do because we love the game of football so much. And we were like those feral fans in the outer in the 70s and the 80s. Sometimes these days I think that perhaps we all get, particularly the media apparently, um, can get caught up too much in the sideshows that accompany football. 
and not concentrate enough on the game. And a lot of these sideshows exist because of the game of football. We're only interested in them in terms of how it affects our teams or our favourite players. Uh, there's been times over the last couple of years with the Essendon Supplement Saga when I've seriously wondered whether I might have been better off pursuing a, a law degree or a degree in pharmacology than brushing up on my football knowledge. But it never takes much to restore the faith. Um, and this happened even last Saturday. I was a bit down in the dumps, you know, reading through the, uh, the latest in the supplement saga. Arrived at the football, 4.40 start time. You know, it doesn't feel like a, a real game. I wanted the old days back and I was pretty quiet for the first three quarters. So much so that one of my colleagues turned to me and said, are you all right? We, we haven't heard a peep out of you all afternoon. But the last quarter was a ripper. It was a couple of points of difference, the entire 30 minutes. Could have gone either way. Everyone got excited. And as David Zaharakis ran in to kick what proved to be the winning goal for Essendon, I instinctively smashed my fist on the table, sending a row of laptops leaping into the air as that same colleague loudly announced to the rest of the press box, he's back. <laughs> I think football and football journalism may be a more sanitised and homogenised business these days, but that comment was like music to my ears. The required reassurance that beneath this hard and crusty professional exterior, still beats the heart of a truly immature football lunatic still wrapped in a metaphorical red and black duffel coat. Thank you. Thank you, Rowan. Fantastic to hear from you and it was great to have you here today. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we, we now have a, a very special treat. Uh, we've been through 11 Bob Rose lectures, this is the 12th, and we have never heard from her before, but I'd like to invite to the stage to give thanks to our speakers. Would you please give her a big round of applause? Elsie Rose with her granddaughter, Sally. Thank you. Look, I won't keep you long. I'm not at all used to doing this, um, and particularly after the speakers today. But, and I've made some notes, and I'm afraid I'm going to be going over a bit of the same, same um, territory as Michael and Kevin touched on, but I can't ad lib, so please just bear with me. First of all, I would like to mention this event. It just doesn't happen. It takes planning and work. And it's becoming, a, it has become a day when we meet up with friends and we listen to wonderful speakers such as today. So to all the organisers and the people that make this possible, thank you very much. I would like to speak of the Robert Rose Foundation. The board members work very hard to keep this charity going and they always need help. My son Robert became a quadriplegic on St Valentine's Day in 1974, one week after his 22nd birthday. We were lucky with the timing of his car accident. 10 days prior to this terrible event, the TAC, compensation scheme was introduced. I really don't know how my family would have survived financially without that support. There were no fortunes to be made in Bob's playing or coaching days. Whilst moving house last year, I came across a Collingwood annual report and it listed the awards for the year, major ones, and the minor ones. There was one given to players who had attended every training session for the year. Bob, of course, was one of about half a dozen. But this one came with a cash prize. I wonder what we did with that two guineas. 
People suffer, suffer spinal injuries in so many ways and most have no TAC support. The foundation was in its very early days and we were attending a family reunion in Swan Hill. Peter had taken a pile of letters requesting help from the foundation. He asked me to read them. People mentioned wheelchairs and a hoist for lifting and aids that would make life a little more bearable. But the ones that shocked me the most were for such simple things. Not much money involved, really. One letter had a profound impact on me. It was from a man, a quadriplegic. He was seeking help for some dental work. To me, it seemed so cruel that in addition to the daily difficulties and indignities he would suffer, being unable to enjoy a meal without pain or discomfort just seemed really unfair. On the table today, you will find envelopes. To those who have contributed, I thank you. To those who haven't, Elsie gives a little nudge. <laughs> it's not too late. The money will be wisely spent on those so deserving of our help. Thank you. Could I please ask John Sylvester to come forward and um, we've got a special gift for you, John, thank you. John Sylvester, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And also to Rowan Connolly, if you could come forward, Rowan, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please thank Elsie and Sally Rose. Thank you, Elsie. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to especially thank Jeff Slattery and Slattery Publishing for those kind gifts. Thank you, Jeff, for your wonderful supporter of this event. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd also like to thank the RACV who have done an amazing amount to help put this day together and also the workhorse of the CBD group, David Poulton, who's already had a mention, but he normally comes to me before the luncheon and said, please don't mention anything about me today. He didn't get the chance today. So David, thank you very much for your wonderful <laughs> work. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the formal part of the lunch. Please feel free to enjoy company with friends. Thank you so much for coming along today and we look forward to seeing you all again next year. Thank you.